are watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Celestial greetings. I'm Janet Booth, a professional astrologer from West Hartford, Connecticut, and welcome to my program on astrology called Looking Up. This is a very special day because I have a guest. Usually just you see me here all alone every month. But I have invited an old friend, someone who's been an astrologer for a long time like me and probably past lives as well as the present life. And we know each other very well from the Astrological Society of Connecticut. Welcome, Charlie Edgerton. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Janet. Thanks for coming. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So, Charlie, I understand that in addition to doing your astrological work, which you go way back into the 70s on that, and you used to have a show on the UMass Amherst well, a, a radio, radio station. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you've done media things over the years, too. But there's another passion that equals or surpasses, if it could possibly, I can't imagine, astrology <laughs> in your life. And speak for a little moment about that. Uh, that would be uh, past life regression. Uh, I first learned, I, I first regressed at the same time that I was, I was introduced to astrology uh -huh. through Isabel Hickey. Uh, I first regressed in 1970, didn't do a lot with it. I'm going to fast forward this. Um, I regressed four or five or six times between, well, three or four times in the beginning and then three or four times for the, over the next 15 or 20 years, and then in the early 2000s, 2003, I got hooked up with um, Roger Wolger and Pat Walsh, and uh, Pat Walsh came to lecture, actually, at the Astrological Society of Connecticut, and when I was listening to her, the voice, the little voice inside me went, oh, you got to hook into this. I and, remember. And so I worked, I worked with them for a number of years, never got certified, but nonetheless, it, went to many five-day workshops and, and weekends, uh, et cetera. And in that time, um, I have regressed somewhere around 150 people. I've, regre I've been regressed myself somewhere between 30 and 40 times. So I'm really comfortable mm -hmm. with past life regression, even though 95 out of 100 people go, oh, I don't want to know about the past. Right, right. Um, the mm -hmm. other five people in 100 are, are the ones that I really enjoy spending time with and the ones who, who are curious about it. Um, it really holds a lot of really profound answers to what's going on today because it's just a long continuum. Life is, is just a, who, somebody, uh, C.S. Lewis, I think, was the first one who said, we are not humans having a spiritual experience we are spirits having a human experience. And if you understand reincarnation and the, the universe and the cosmos and all that stuff, yes, the spirit that is in each one of us is simply occupying this body. When the body dies, the spirit carries on. Um, I always, whenever I, I, I use the word death in terms of astrology or, or past life work, I always accompany it with the two word phrase and rebirth. Mm -hmm. There's no death without a rebirth. So, so I, I love the past life work. It, it, it goes really, really deep and, and, and brings answers for this lifetime. Mm -hmm. But enough of that. This is about astrology. Well, I want to connect them up for a second because if we think in terms of a continuum and multiple lifetimes and reincarnation, then what is the chart of your birth chart of this lifetime but your curriculum or your study plan for what you're here learning in the school of life in this lifetime? I don't know if I'm going to answer your question specifically, but in particular, 
that which draws me to such a thing as past life regression is my 12th house Neptune, among other things. I also have Pluto on my nadir and Scorpio rising. All of those things point toward me wanting to know more about the cosmos, more about the universe, more about my karma, my past, and how it relates to my present. It's not just my past. It's, it's how, because our past is part of our present, whether it's in this lifetime or from other lifetimes. So, yeah, it's my 12th house Neptune right. and Pluto on the midheaven. Well, I'm glad you brought those up because those are outer planets. Oh, yeah. And amongst the many things you do as a board member and volunteer for the Astrological Society of Connecticut, you frequently give our little class that comes before the regular lecture called the pre-lecture. Yes. And sometimes you go out with the speaker bureau like you're going to on your birthday this month <laughs> yes. and give a lecture down in Portland or, or a month. class. Yep. And then sometimes you also give a basics of astrology class at the New Age Fairs, our yes. quarterly New Age Fairs. And for viewers who are interested, myasc.org. That's where you'll find information about the Astrological Society. And at the February 2017 New Age Fair on the 5th, it's Super Bowl Sunday, but before the right. Super Bowl, you're going to do your class on the outer planets and aspects or interconnections about the outer planets. Yeah, the forecast for this year in terms of the outer planets because the outer planets have a longer effect as far as a time frame is concerned versus the inner planets and the slow moving planets which only affect us for a few hours or a day or a few days. The slow moving planets, most of them affect us all year long and have three hits or at least one hit. Usually it's three hits. Because sometimes of, five. Really? Mm -hmm. When Pluto was going over my moon, it did it five times. That mm -hmm. was in 1908, yep. uh, I think. Um, 2008. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> I know, it's so old. easy to get our centuries mixed up. Really? Um, but yeah, you were talking about Saturn a moment ago, and I was thinking, or maybe you weren't, but as we're no. talking about outer planets, well, then I was thinking about Saturn. You know, until modern day when we had technology and we have telescopes, all that astrology had to work with was the visible to the naked eye planets. Seven heavenly bodies, Saturn being the farthest out, and now we keep finding things further out and further out and further out. So when uh, you and I talked about you being a guest today on my show, I said, what would you like to talk about? And you said... Eris. And I said, why? Because... There is not, I don't think, enough attention in the astrological community or amongst the astrological community given to Eris. It was only discovered in 2005. Um, it's twice as far out as Pluto. We don't know that much about it, but we know enough now mm -hmm. between the mythology, which is, oh, it, it's rich. You, you got to love the mythology and how it connects astrology to everyday living and, and mm -hmm. the, the science and the art of astrology. Um, uh, so, um, right. Not enough people are talking about it. Not enough people know about it. They don't respect Eris. They don't put her in the charts. So we're on a movement to get more about Eris. We are. And, and the one curious thing about Eris right now is, and you and I pronounce it differently, but so, but you and I pronounce Uranus the same and most astrologers pronounce it a different way. But anyway, so pronunciation yes. is what it is. Um, uh, where was I going with that? Um, Mm. Not enough astrologers are using Eris. Uh, Eris. And um, Eris went into the sign of Aries in the 1920s and leaves the sign of Aries in the 2040s. <laughs> yeah, long so, time. And it, takes, and it takes 500 years to go around the sun, and it's an elliptical orbit, so some time spans for a particular sign are longer, and some time spans for a particular sign are much shorter. But in this case, it's 120 years in the sign of Aries for all of us. So one argument might be from an astrologer, well, it doesn't move really fast, so why bother paying attention to it? Right. Well, <laughs> the reason to bother paying attention to it is because everybody's chart is different, and it's in a different house in everybody's chart, and it has different aspects to everybody's uh to everybody's particular uh, birth chart. So um, those are the two things that, that are certainly well worth paying attention to, I think. Right, and when it does finally visit one of your degrees of one of your birth planets. <laughs> if it does. If and when it does, 11, 9 to 11 hits. 
over the course of about five or six years. Yeah. So it does things. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's a very slow mover, but it, it, it nonetheless mm -hmm. is, 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 a, is a changer. Absolutely. So the discoverers of Eris, we have to give some credit to them. They were astronomers. Oh yes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but here's what's funny. Mike Brown and his team out at Palomar, part of Caltech, are the ones who've discovered Sedna and Quo RR and Maki Maki and several of these other what we call Kuiper Belt objects. That's everything out past Neptune. And they had taken photographs in 2003, Three, yeah. but didn't realize it was a planet until 2005. They didn't get to the photos till 2005. Right, yeah. They take a lot of pictures. Then yeah. they got to have the, probably the interns, you know, mm. study them or something. And when they finally realized, yes, this must be a planet, good Mike Brown, he does respect astrologers, and he wrote down the time that they really discovered Eris, and so that we could have a chart for that. That is so important in astrology is, is, is the, the time of, of any particular event, whether it's a birth or when you put a letter in the mail or when you say your wedding vows or when you put the for sale sign in the... Mm -hmm. Timing is so important and sometimes to the minute and like, like a horary chart, you need, you need it to the minute. So, so time and God and Goddess and Great Spirit, bless him for being as respectful of astrologers mm -hmm. as he is. I'll let it go with that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just want to, for viewers who might not know what you just referred to, horary chart, that's a chart of the moment that a question is asked, yeah. and it has the answer to the question oh, in yeah. the chart, if you're lucky. And um, we were talking at lunch and joking about the difference between astronomers and astrologers. <laughs> and what did you say about astronomers? One of the things that bears on horary. Um, I'm not sure, you'll have to. I... Oh, well I've sometimes said, you know, if people start talking about, oh, are the signs different? Are there 13 signs? What about this Ophiuchus? And I go, oh, that's astronomers talking to you, not astrologers. So when was the last time an astronomer did your chart for you? And you said, yeah, when was the last time an astronomer helped you find a missing object? Because that's what horary can do very nicely. Oh, yes. Yeah, so that's funny. Yeah. But, you know, the other <laughs> astronomers came back. They gave a new name to this planet. Mike and his team started off calling it Xena. Xena. The warrior princess from the TV show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lucy Lawless. Mm-hmm. Yep. She has the planet Eris conjunct her sun. Yes, yes. I know, that's so funny, the synchronicity. You gotta but, love it. But then the astronomers decided to name this object Eris, which comes from the Greco-Roman mythology pantheon where all the other planet names come from. So I think in that sense, it was the right thing to do. It was amazing, yes, it, it was amazing, uh, yes. But how can they know? See, this is what cracks me up about astronomers because the synchronicity is working through them even though they don't want to think about the astrological implications. That's the thing about the un unconscious and the subconscious. You're not, oh, no, none of us is aware of it, is, of it, of it working as it is working. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what all of the outer planets are about, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and Eris. Um, are, are, is our connection to the unconscious and the subconscious. And the unseen. Uh, which allows us to raise our vibration and evolve. Yes, to go past the limits that Saturn represents with its rings around it. Yes, yes, yes. So talk for a moment about the correlates between the outer planets, what they represent, what they were named by the astronomers, and the centuries in which they were discovered and what were the developments at those times. The telescope was discovered in the 16th century or, or was it Uranus? In I think it had to have been discovered just shortly before Uranus was discovered, so I'm gonna say mid um, 1700s. Mid 1700s. I, I, I think it was the telescope in the 1600s. Well, there may have been, yes. Uranus mm -hmm. discovered okay. in the 1700s, which was a time on this planet of revolution mm -hmm. and an intellectual, uh, profound intellectual growth. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and a coming together, a starting to come together of all of the people of the Earth. They were, they were become, beginning to become more, much more well-connected. Mm -hmm. Neptune in the 1700s, which was a... 1800s. I, I, mm -hmm. Excuse me. It's okay. Thank you. I'll keep um, you an honest man, <laughs> if I can. Thank you. You do the best you can anyway. Um, 
Neptune in, in, in the, in the uh, 1800s, when there were profound uh, evolutionary steps in medicine and in, and in spirituality, in, in uh, religion, started, religion started to slide a little bit because it was much more of a political, social structure and spirituality, which really is uh, more etheric and ethereal and, and cosmic, and I don't know exactly what the right words are, but those are mm -hmm. close. Right. Um, <laughs> people started to pay attention, more attention to the, their real spirituality and not the structure of, of religion. That right. was the 1800s. Right, and just to connect this a little more for the audience, the Uranus with revolution, it rules revolution. Yes, yes. It rules the individual and people power as opposed to regal king power. And then Neptune rules spirituality and medicine. So, Among other things. Yes, the things that it, they it, correlate with are what are sort of blossoming at the time of their discovery. Yeah, and ne Neptune rules uh, has to do with the ocean mm -hmm. um, and oil, mm -hmm. and that was the time that whale oil was 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 going out and, and petroleum was coming in. Correct. Blah, blah, and Neptune is petroleum, blah, blah. Um, and then the uh, 20th century, the 1900s, was when Pluto was discovered. Pluto was discovered at approximately the same time we learned how to split the atom. And blow up the world. Yeah, yeah. and, and that's, that's what Pluto was about, is about that incredible mm -hmm. reserve of power that we, we don't even know we have. Right. And, 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 and those how something so little can act in such a big way. Oh, yeah. Which is true. Pluto, too, it's so little, yeah. but it acts in a big way. Which, if I may step aside yes, really quickly. Yes, go right ahead. I, I take offense, and this is personal, and it's just a bias, but I, 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 and I don't usually take offense at much, but I, I did take offense when, the, when a small percentage of the astronomical community Mm -hmm. decided to try and get 15 minutes of fame and change the classification of things. And they, they decided that Pluto was a dwarf planet. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. Pluto is arguably, certainly in terms of astrology, is arguably the most powerful planet. It's, 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 it's yes. debatable. It's yes. arguable. But there, there, there can be a very strong argument for I it. I know. And every time I hear that stupid dwarf word, oh, I always hear, hi-ho, hi-ho, <laughs> it's off to work we go. You know, it's like, come on. You couldn't have even had it be something like miniature or demure, diminutive so planetet. Yeah. I don't know. So okay. in, in my opinion, it was somebody uh, seeking 15 minutes of fame because like I say, as far as astrology is concerned, and and ninety nine percent of the astrologers out there are concerned, ninety at least ninety percent. I can't speak for all of them because they're a pack of cats. Well, but not the traditionalists. They don't use anything after Saturn. Yeah. But other than them, and we won't go into that. No, okay. we won't. We no, shouldn't. No, we don't we have won't. time. We don't. That would be a whole another half another hour. hour. Yeah. <laughs> um, Pluto is ain't nothing ain't, ain't ain't no dwarf. Ain't nothing dwarfy about it. Nope. Nope. Uh, so now, fast forward us up to the twenty first century. Twenty first century. So now, in two thousand and five, we discover Eris. We took the pictures in two thousand three. Blah blah, and um, so now we have Eris, um, the, the female warrior, uh, mythologically the sister of Ares, the god of war, uh, Mars, the god of war, depending on Greek or Roman. Blah blah. Um, Eris, the sister of Mars. However, and I, I take a quote from Henry, Henry Seltzer. Seltzer. Mm -hmm. um, Mars goes to war, goes to battle. I, 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 it's not an exact quote, but it was, it's very close. Mars goes to battle. Mars goes to war because he wants to. Eris goes to war, goes to battle because she needs to. Oh. She has a cause. Ah. She has a purpose. It's it's the the it's the difference between impulsive and and driven, or even reactive, and yes. plotting, or if maybe not plotting, but with purpose. With Absolutely, purpose. with a, with a yes. sole purpose. That, yes. That's that's one of the words that Henry used a lot in his book is is the, the two word phrase sole purpose. Um, and and, well, that, and that elevates the energy of Eris way past just being about rivalry or rabble-rousing, oh, yeah. you know, she shakes things up, 
but for a reason. But for a good reason. And that relates to, you know, in mythology, Eris had many children. None of them were fathered by anything. Just she had them. Right. And they had awful names like toil and trouble and grievances yeah. and, you know, bad things. And then she had the one, that was the girls. She had the son named Oath. Oath, yes. Yes. And that bespeaks of how important truth is to Eris. Which brings us to the point in evolution where we are in, in, at this stage of, uh, of the 21st century. Um, if I may digress only slightly, and I, only, I don't want to go there for any length of time, but <clears throat> I won't even mention his name. The president-elect. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, he's, oh, he's, he's now the president. Yeah, the that's president. right, it was yes. the other day. That one. Um, uh, our new president, um, the Dalai Lama said it, 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 it's a good thing because, and I, I, I totally paraphrase, this is his message, not his words, but his message was, it's, it, 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 we need this in order to galvanize ourselves for a greater purpose and a greater cause, which is very Ericinian. Arisenian. 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 I don't know. Henry had a word, an adjective for that. <laughs> but but yeah. very heiress like mm -hmm. um, So sometimes we, as a, a a civilization, need a stimulus such as who we have now as president um, to 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 really understand that we have to work harder. Right. For our ideals. Well, this reminds me of a comment from a woman from the march the day after the inauguration. And she said, perhaps I had become too complacent during the Obama years yeah. because we made social progress and it all seemed like it was a wave going in the right direction. Well, it's like now the wave is pulling back. Yeah. And so it is that march, so many more people came together for that than for the inauguration. Yeah. And it, it was mostly women, called the Women's March, and Eris being a woman goddess in our planetary pantheon, which there are not that many women. There are more of the male planets in, in our astrology. So it's showing that this is the century and the time for women to come into their I don't know if I want to say rightful place, but let's just say a stronger position, not a back seat, a co-driver. Yeah. We don't have to take the whole bus over, but you know, side we're, not side going, is good. we're not going to the back. We're Rosa Parks, you know, we're not going to the yeah. back of the bus. And, and also, it's, it's not just women, it's, it's, it's the woman's energy. Carl Jung right. had anima and animus. Right, right. He said, within every woman there is a warrior, within every man there is a, a, a goddess, a healer, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Every, every person has a sense of both genders even though they are a particular gender, although, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Nowadays, that's a spectrum. Us, blah, blah. It's a continuum, <laughs> yes. Um, so, so that um, the time has also come for men as a gender to let go of, of the old gender identities, just as it's time for women to let right. go of the old yes, gender identities and, and, and just be stronger. Uh, it's, to be in touch with the warrior inside of you, whether you're a man or a woman, is, is right, one of is, because if the warrior, particularly if the warrior has a cause. Right, and the Eris, she is a warrior. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you've told me that of the many key words that the astrologers who try to put Eris into a chart usually use, you lean away from most of them. But let's talk about those for a moment. Well, it's not, it's not that I lean away from most of them, because for a long time I used the two key words, that, that first come to mind, uh, chaos and disorder. Mm -hmm. But I realized after doing that for a long enough time that that wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. Any more than, than when you're talking about Pluto and you're talking about death, death isn't enough. It's always, for me, or 99% of the time, death and rebirth. Mm -hmm. So with Eris, the chaos and disorder, um, I, I often simply say, um, yes, that's that's the starting point. You, you have chaos and disorder wherever you have it in your in your in your, in your life, whatever house you have it in, whatever however it's aspected. However, because you have the chaos and disorder, you have learned how to bring clarity and harmony and focus to 
whatever the challenges are. So it's mm -hmm. not just chaos and disorder. It's chaos and disorder which give rise, which give birth to order and clarity and, and, and harmony and, mm -hmm. and focus. Mm -hmm. Just like when we talk about Chiron, which is an uh, asteroid, I suppose, yeah. um, they don't give that planetary status, and when are they going to? They should probably, yeah. but we call it the wounded healer. Yes. Well, some people focus on, oh yeah, it brings the wounds, but the ultimate result of that afterwards is the healing from the wounds. Oh yes, so. and, mm -hmm. and not only the self-healing, but the ability to bring heal, the ability to help other people heal themselves. Yes. So some of the other keywords, uh, rivalry is a big one from the myth of when Eris kind of um, caused a problem amongst some of the other goddesses about who was the fairest of them all. And we do sometimes see that it brings out rivalry, but that kind of fighting for a, a just cause is very important. Now, um, some of the people who maybe have a strong iris kind of um, personality. Is there anyone who comes to mind for you? I'm not sure if I'm, I'm pronouncing this name right. Uh, Wollencroft, the woman from the 1700s? Oh, mm -hmm. Mary Wall Wollencroft? She Something was one like that. Of, she was one of the birthers right. of, of the feminist music movement. Um, yes. In, in the 1700s or was it 1800s? Uh, it was in the 1800s. They were abolitionists and oftentimes mm -hmm. um, prohibitionists mm -hmm. and then feminists and suffragettes, you know, with Susan B. Anthony and that crowd. Oh, oh yes. you, you have a list. Or we we, we, we have, made a list and I don't know where we yeah. put that. Yeah. Her Herman Melville had, uh, had um, air is strong in his chart. Um, and again, the, the, the cause, you know, mm -hmm. was Ahab driven or what? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Right. Well, there's plenty that people can look at there. I, I'm sure viewers are probably wondering, well, what about my chart? And you mentioned how since the sign won't be different from anybody else's, what's right. important is that house or the department that it comes into and the other connections it makes to other planets called aspects. So those are things you might want to explore with your astrologer, folks. Um, and for people who might want to do a little reading on Eris, why don't we show the book from Henry Seltzer? He's the one who came up with the symbol that we use for Eris. And maybe while you're showing that book, you can um, talk about that symbol for a moment. Uh, um, Henry Seltzer, as you said, uh, created that symbol. And he is the only one I've ever seen who, who, who described his own creation of the symbol as a combination of Venus and Mars and Pluto. These are Henry's words. Mm -hmm. um, it, it looks like a combination of Venus and Mars. You don't see much Pluto in there. But, right. Um, it's the circle over a downward pointing arrow. Yes. So, yep. So that's the book, Henry Seltzer with a T, S-E-L-T-Z-E-R, The Tenth Planet. That's You'll just also one of many. find, yeah, yep. Yeah. There's another author, Tom Canfield, who wrote about the U.S. history and Eris, Yankee Doodle, Discord. And he has another smaller pamphlet book on Eris in the houses and signs and planets and things like that. And we're coming down to our very last minute here. It's hard to believe. So it's been fun talking about e Eris or Eris, however you like to say. <laughs> and Charlie, thanks for being my guest today. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. And as I said, an honor. Thank you Thank for having you. me. And to my viewers, come back and learn some more about astrology soon on Looking Up. Mm -hmm.